So we're going to talk about dependent t-tests and we're going to make sure that you understand the difference between those and one sample t-tests. Before we jump forward, I want to kind of highlight how the pattern has worked thus far for learning tests. So we first learned how to do an individual Z and then we had to change it up a little bit to learn how to do a one sample Z. And then we had to change that up a little bit to do a one sample T. And now we're gonna change that up a little bit to do a dependent T. So what you'll notice is that we are gonna learn a test and then we're gonna explain why that test won't work under all circumstances. And then we're going to change it, the math primarily just a little bit. And so that's gonna be the pattern for the rest of the course. Is we, once we learn something, we're gonna tweak it a little bit to expand our application of that test. So today we're gonna to talk about the dependent T. And the dependent T, this is gonna be the test that we use when we have a repeated measures design. A repeated measures design is when we look at two sets of scores from the same person. So that's why we call it a repeated measures. Or we also call it a within subjects design because we're looking within the subject. So let's say I wanted to know if someone's blood pressure was lower after owning a, a dog. It would be better for me to look at a person before and after owning the dog than it would be to look at a group of people who own dogs and a group of people who don't own dogs. Because the people who um, are grouped, they have different blood pressures. Some are high, some are low, and I'm not sure if that um, blood pressure tendency might dictate whether they own a dog or not. But if I look at what somebody, a group of people look like before they own a dog, then I give them all dogs and then look at what they look like after the dogs. Then I really know what was due to the dog and not just a natural tendency um, for their blood pressure. So this can really answer the question more effectively. However, it changes the math. Uh, we can no longer just look at one sample of people. What is the blood pressure of dog owners compared to a national average? We wanna look at each person's change in blood pressure. And so that's gonna be the focus of how we calculate this test statistic. It looks very much like a one sample T, except we're gonna be looking at it on the change. So this ends up working out really well statistically because you're more similar to yourself than you are to other people. So all that random variability that happens when we do sampling is kind of gone. So if I wanted to compare people who own dogs and people who don't own dogs, there's lots of differences between them. Um, whether they exercise, whether they drink coffee, whether they are stressed out at work, all that stuff lends to individual differences that makes our distribution very wide. But if I'm looking at you, you're the most similar to yourself as, you, as anyone else, right? So you're gonna have the same level of stress and same level of coffee consumption and stream, same level of genetic factors. All that stuff carries over. So there's much less variability from the first measurement to the second measurement. So any change between the before and the after is really due to the dog. So this really is a nice way to answer these questions effectively. And so we will use a dependent T when we're looking at the same person over and over again, but it also may be when we're looking at people who are matched up on some element. So most of the time we're going to see people, or sorry, you see dependent T tests doing before and after designs on the same person. But I do want to highlight that if I'm looking at, let's say, couples, and I want to know if husbands have better ratings of their marriage than wives, it wouldn't make sense for me to go out and measure a bunch of random husbands and then a separate random group of wives and see if they rate their marriage um, differently. What I should do is take a husband, ask his opinion, and then take his wife and ask her opinion and see if there's a difference between the two. So that um, approach would actually let me see if the couples have differences in their uh, rating of their marriage. So that would be where we're coupling up the Joneses and the Dam family and the Johnsons, right? So um, we want to look at these families as if they're a unit. And so that makes it more like it's the same person rather than being the same person, it's the same couple. So anytime we would be matching people up, we would use a dependent T. So if we're using couples, if we're using um, a, a daughter and seeing if she has the same height as the mother, right? That would be, a, we would have to match them up on their family. So that would also be another case of the dependent T. 
So I'm going to use this example to explain what we're going to do with a dependent T. Let's say I have recorded the IQ of four participants and then I give them some intervention. Let's say vitamin K. I make them consume vitamin K. I have no idea what vitamin K is, so don't consume it because I did this pretend example. But let's say after the vitamin K, Mary's IQ goes to 150 and then Bob, his changes to 125 and Sue changes to 98 and Jan 135. So what I can see is I have the data before they consumed vitamin K, I recorded their IQ score, and then I recorded their IQ score again after the intervention, which is vitamin K. What I'm really interested in is in the difference. I could care less that Mary started at 140 and Sue started at 90. That's not really interesting to me. I don't care that someone was high or low or in the middle. But what I really care about is the change. So I can see that Mary went up 10 points, Bob went up 25, Sue went up eight, and Jan went up 25. So this is very interesting to us because now I can see what the difference is. Let's say I was trying to market vitamin K. I wouldn't want to say, oh, and Mary went from 140 to 150 and Bob went from 100 to 125. Instead, I'd say, hey, listen, folks, um, everybody improved on their IQ after taking vitamin K and maybe I would even report a number that best represents everyone. Do we have a number we've learned how to calculate that best represents an entire group? Hopefully you're thinking about the mean. So what I would want to report if I wanted to sell vitamin K is say on average my mean difference in improvement in IQ scores was blank. So we're going to end up focusing on this different score because that's really where the meat is. I don't care where they started and where they ended. I really only care what their change was. So much so that I can just forget about their original data to begin with. We're going to focus on this different score so that I can talk about the change that happened due to my intervention. Now you want to think about, let's say that vitamin K did nothing. It didn't improve IQ or hurt IQ. What do we expect the average difference to be if, I, if vitamin K does nothing at all? If vitamin K does nothing at all, we would expect this difference to be roughly about zero. Maybe somebody went up one or two points by chance, but we would expect it roughly to be zero, right? So what we're gonna do is look at our true difference, what we actually got, and see how it differs from the expectation of being zero. So let's talk about what the dependent T is going to do. So we're going to handle the two scores we've gotten, we received from people by looking at their different scores. So for each person or pair, if it were a couple, we subtract one score from the other. Now, once we have that different score for each person, we're gonna treat it as if those are the scores we're really interested in. That's the sampling of scores we're gonna care about. So that's our new sample. That's why we're not gonna be so different from a one sample T. We just had to do a little bit of extra legwork to get the sample that we were interested in. So we do a t-test for dependent samples the same way we would do a t-test for the one sample t, except we're going to use the different scores instead of actually using the raw data. And now we're going to assume the population mean is zero. So remember, the null hypothesis is no difference. And we remember that, or we always assume the null hypothesis to be true. So we're going to assume that there's no difference until we prove otherwise, right? So we're going to assume that the population mean from which we're comparing it to is zero. So let's talk about what that means. When we had the one sample t, this was the formula. We had x bar minus mu divided by the standard deviation divided by the square root of n. Well, for our dependent t, it's going to look like this, not too different. Instead of doing x bar, we're going to do d bar. And d stands for the difference between the scores, right? So we're now going to look at the mean difference minus mu divided by the standard deviation of the different scores divided by the square root of n. And so if I'm assuming the null hypothesis to be true, then really the mu should be zero. So what I'm actually going to be doing is I'm going to say d bar minus zero, which is nice because then it just, the formula is d bar minus the standard deviation of d divided by the square root of n. So you'll see that really the one sample T and the dependent sample T are no different. It's just that we had to find the different scores 
so that we can get our one sample that we're interested in and calculate our average difference score to plug that into the formula. So this is the theory behind what's happening with the dependent T. Now we're going to do the six steps to inferential statistics with an example so you can see how this works in practice. <laughs> 